Hi everyone, welcome to uh, lecture number two for narrative nonfiction. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the sort of back half of Mark Doty's book, uh, Still Life with Oyster and Lemon. And uh, by now, hopefully you're getting into a little bit of the rhythm of how sort of Doty is organizing this work. As you can probably tell, it's kind of loosely bound together um, by this uh, sort of um, coincidence of uh, Dutch still life painting and sort of like the idea of looking at art in general as it presents itself in certain aspects of Doty's life, certain aspects of his memory, of his consciousness. And basically, you have a, sort of like Doty's own way of looking, his voice, and just his experience that kind of bind these things together. And as if it's really driving at um, like a narrative point in, this, in the same way that a short story would drive at a narrative point. But it's sort of like testing out an, a question through narrative means, right? And if this question is sort of um, how still life or how art in general um, reveals aspects of life to us, reveals uh, something about the way we perceive things like time and form and beauty and memory, um, then maybe that allows us um, to kind of examine these things in a way that isn't so much uh, feeling like we're sitting in an art history class, but lets us feel a little bit like we experience it when we experience it ourselves, uh, when we go to a museum, uh, when we see a, a piece of art hanging in a friend's house, something like that. And hopefully um, you're sort of getting used to sort of the way he sort of flows in and out of some of these paintings and things. As you've probably gotten, um, it's, it can be helpful, uh, I didn't include all of them because there's so many, um, to have a browser open or have your phone open and like pull up some of these pieces as he's talking about them because I think probably though he does a really, really good job of just straight up ekphrasis in describing these images. Uh, he, I, th I think it's helpful to kind of see the choices he makes and the way he describes them. Your own choices might have been different. You might have um, used a different verb here or there, a different adjective or something. But if you can sort of cozy up to the idea that seeing um, his own way of seeing at work, um, then you can sort of begin to know how you might see things differently. Um, the whole point here for us is kind of to just to let Doty present us with opportunities to think about the relationship between writing and art. And I want to talk about a few of those uh, moments here. Um, so if you do have the book, I'll, I'll be referring to just a few specific things. Um, I think it's important, the question he asks on page 36 about um, when painted, is a cabbage any less precious um, than a golden cup? And one of the things he sort of asks us to consider is like the relative value of aesthetic objects. When you look at something, something that for whatever reason seems beautiful or captivating or formally um, interesting or unique. Um, one of the things that we look for is it, it can be hard to divorce the question of monetary value from something like that. So am I looking at something expensive as opposed to am I looking at something good? Um, and especially in a culture that's driven by consumption, it, it can be easy uh, to sort of mistake one for the other. And what I think Doty raises in this question, and this is, again is on page 36, um, is to kind of point out, like, remember that what you're looking at doesn't need, uh, you know, a picture of uh, something very humble, um, harvest, a meager feast, uh, can be just as beautifully executed, if not more so, than the picture um, that aspires to render, you know, um, angels and saints. And this is sort of the idea of still in general, isn't it, right? That if that still lives are First of all, they're heavily composed, but they're also kind of mundane, relatively mundane things. Oh, here's a bouquet of flowers, right? Uh, here's an orange I started peeling. Um, here's a decanter of wine that's like rusting away on the table. These aren't the, these are the kind of mundane everyday things that we might not think of as being worthy of so much skill. When you think, when you look and you th see all these paintings, what you're probably overwhelmed by is just the the technique and the skill and the ability of these painters to kind of make these things come to life. Um, but you also have to remember that like um, in choosing these images and choosing these forms, what they're really doing is presenting style, right? I mean, in, to, in a certain way for writers, one of the most challenging things is to take something kind of every day and make it unique, make it captivating, make it powerful. And if you think about a lot of the short story tradition in the back half of the um, in, in the middle of the 20th century, a lot of what ends up happening after the Industrial Revolution and after the sort of Romantic period and in the modern period is you have a lot of stories that are looking at um, very simple and relatively mundane interactions. Um, you know, girl gets boy, girl loses boy, girl feels ennui, you know, and 
even though that's an oversimplification, I think what it points to is that a lot of us tell, are using very sort of basic materials to make our audiences feel things. And those materials are cousin to what we see in still life painting, techniques of light and shading and mood and form, right? though they present themselves differently in our own work. Um, what we should be interested in is thinking about like there isn't really anything you can look at as long as you look at it hard and you have look at it with genuine interest and in Dodi's case affection and imagination. If you look at something hard enough, there's no reason you can't elevate it um, to the level of art that would be worthy of right, appealing appearing in a book like this. Yeah. Um, other things um, for us to be thinking about here a little bit um, is the role of time. I've said uh, previously that one of the things about writing in general that separates it from a medium like painting is that it requires time to do it. You can't just like sit down, look at this page of words and like immediately just comprehend it as one flat surface. Whereas when you look at a still life, yes, of course, you can like digest little bits of it, um, but it, it does, it. nothing changes about it at any given moment. It's exactly as it is, no matter what place and time you are standing looking at it. And this is different, obviously, from something like music or film or dance, which require, you know, the medium of time to be able to basically make them work and make them change in a way that you can, uh, we can then understand and process them. So one of the ways that Dodi talks about this um, happens on page 40 when he talks about there's a Japanese word for basically things made more beautiful through use and through time. And one of the things I think, too, is that one of the mistakes um, we can make is if we think about art uh, or even objects or beauty as collectors, um, we can sometimes be mistaken in thinking that things have to be pristine, um, that they have to be beautiful because they are um, traditionally or stereotypically beautiful even. And I think we, we talked about this a little bit when we read Paget's piece about the salt and pepper shakers, um, that really beauty can come through use. I mean, if you think about the things that are perhaps most precious to you, a lot of them, I would wager, are not in pristine mint condition, right? And sometimes the affection we get through something can come through the very same process that brings about wear and tear on an object. And so for still life paintings, these are paintings of things that are, you know, at least ostensibly in use. And when you think about what you want to describe in your own acrostic work, don't feel as though you have to choose unblemished things. There's some great images here, and I can um, share a couple of these with you just so you can get a get a look at them. That sort of indicate this. One of the ways that still life tends to do this often is with ripeness and spoiling of fruit. There's actually a whole allegorical process about uh, virginity and it has to do with like certain fruits and whether or not they're ripe or rotten or whatever. Um, a little outside of our content area here. Um, but here's one for instance, um, where you've got um, a still life with fruits in various stage of ripeness and decay. So you can see sort of the fly and like the sort of glistening putrescence of some of the food starting to kind of rotten and spoil and kind of curdle open here. Um, and one of the things that is kind of interesting and beautiful about this is that it allows for such inflection and such change. I mean, you know, if you look at a, at a bowl of ripe oranges, a lot of them can sort of seem homogenous if they're all right in the same stage of ripeness, but here, this decay, this movement in time is interesting to us. And you should think about this as you look at your own images. If you look at a picture, you look at something and you see uh, evidence of time working. And I don't mean you see like somebody whooshing through the screen or somebody's blurry, but like, you know, things like ripeness, these leaves curling as they dry out, those, that's evidence of time at play, even though we're only looking at a snapshot of it. It's a way in which we can sort of apprehend time in a still image. And so if you're thinking about how can I really incorporate time into a thing that I'm looking at that only happens in a split second, remember that time asserts itself in form. It asserts itself in the way these leaves curl. It asserts itself in color and shade here, right? And so if we think about time that way, maybe it frees us up to be a little more um, perceptive of it in the art that we encounter. Um, other things to look at and to think about here. Um, I think some of the interesting things um, he has to say about poetry are relevant for our purposes here, and I want to point them out. Um, he talks about principles of attention. He says that um, if we first, if we look and, and look, we will be surprised and we'll be rewarded. Basically, we have to have faith 
that if we look hard and long enough at something, something is going to happen. I think of, uh, for instance, uh, Rainier Maria Rilke in this case, when he's looking at the um, statue, uh, the torso of Apollo, and sort of suddenly is struck um, by um, its beauty. And he, he quotes Louis Gluck here and says that poetry is autobiography stripped of context and commentary. And I think that's sort of true. He says later on that poetry um, is anything that is unparaphrasable. So there's no context, um, no commentary. It's just presented as an image. And I think the same thing is true of still lives in general. Here's uh, one he spent time talking about um, these this sort of white asparagus sort of presented to you. You want to ask questions. If you're doing a phrases of this, you might suddenly want to take a story, right? You're talking about the farmer who just cut the, phrase, cut the asparagus bound in a so I think of twine, cut it, and is going to eat it, serve it for dinner this evening. And you could, but all of that is stuff that you would have to invent. It's not actually inherent in the image itself. And what Doty's basically saying is that poetry tries to present an image like this that doesn't require all that other stuff, doesn't require all that invention on the part of the reader. And what that forces you to do is not start looking elsewhere for your material, but you have to look inward. And so if you start to look at the actual colors as they're described, if you start to look at the actual um, kind of demands of careful attention, um, you'll start to just be forced to really do traditional ekphrasis and describe. And that is a part of what we're here for, right? Um, and there's a quote, I'm trying to find it here, he still has it. I don't think I'm gonna be able to find it right now. Um, but when he talks about specifically this uh, picture, of uh, from the Rijksmuseum from quote uh, from Korte. Um he talks about uh, quoting it in Proust's uh, Remembrance of Things Past. Essentially, there is oh here it is page forty five. What most enraptured me, the narrator says, were the asparagus tinged with ultramarine and pink, which shaded off from their heads, finely stippled in mauve and azure through a series of imperceptible gradations to their white feet. And so what that all is nothing none of that leaves anything external to these, to this image, it is all very much in the business of giving you exactly what it sees, of rendering it, letting you eat it with your eyes, basically, and your ears, and the way that it's laid out, you know, um, orally, um, AU, orally. And so the thing I want you to think about is that there is really, in a lot of these pieces, a lack of drama. Right here, he mentions the still life of the cheeses here. You know, there's nothing really inherently dramatic or necessarily inherently interesting. A lot of these things, of course, are very contrived and planned out and sort of set here. But the drama comes from just like this specific moment, the way the light moves through an image. Um, it is all about um, the purpose of looking. These things exist precisely to be looked at. And all while each of them ostensibly has some other use, really here because their coincidence and having been placed next to each other gives us some kind of pleasure in their form, in their color, in their texture, in their shading, in their just uh, position here. And so what we really want is images that, as he says, increase the store of reality, that give us opportunities to thoroughly examine and enjoy the world around us. And that's really what it frames us for. I think in the end, what he sort of ends up saying is that in these still lives, the whole point is that yourself must empty into these things. In order to really see these things, you have to allow yourself to be possessed um, with seeing them. You have to want uh, to find meaning. You have to want to take pleasure in just the shape and beauty of the technique. And you want really is to let your gaze illuminate these objects, illuminate the world around you the way light illuminates the world of these paintings. And hopefully, if you do that, as you start looking more and more at the world around you, you'll say something and you'll see something that makes you say something unparaphrasable that says, this is the way I'm seeing it and the only way I can really put it down to paper is exactly this way. I think Doty gets a, is a long time in getting around to this, but what he basically says is that these objects share an intimacy. These things are intimate with each other because of their placement, because of their color, because of the collision of forms, because we are seeing them. We group them together in an act of seeing. And if you can think about that 
as you approach your own tasks for this course, hopefully what you find is if you search for intimacy between shapes and colors and forms, um, that it will allow you to sort of celebrate that and really let your sort of imagination um, create for you new things out of them. All right. Um, Hopefully you have been enjoying Dodie's work. I know it's kind of a quick read through um, and I'll be anxious to uh, check out what you all have to say about it. All right, signing off for now. Be good.